call two. So here we go. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Good to see some familiar faces back with us. Uh, my name's Nick. We're, I'm with IU5, and we're happy to have this partnership with the Northwest PA Job Connect. And we have with us Dr. Brittany Weatherspoon. She's a district administrator from Clareton School District um, in Pennsylvania. It's in. Uh, we're going to find out. It's somewhere south, down a real down around Pittsburgh. But what we're going to do is we're just going to chat with Dr. Weatherspoon, and then at the very end, what we're going to do is we're going to open it up for question and answer from all of you. So you'll notice in the top right hand corner of your screen or somewhere around, depending on if you're using a, a PC or a Mac, you'll see a little conversation bubble with a question mark in there. And as Dr. Weatherspoon is talking about what she does, her career path, et cetera, uh, feel free to throw any questions in there while we're chatting. And then the last 15 minutes, we'll uh, have Ann Conti, our career readiness facilitator, ask Dr. Weatherspoon those questions. So. As Dr. Weatherspoon is sharing her experiences, don't hesitate to throw those questions in there. So without further ado, I am going to send Dr. Weatherspoon live. You should be seeing her. Welcome. Hello. Good morning. Thank you for having me here today. And we're very lucky to have you. We know district administrators are very, very, very busy folks in these unprecedented times. So you're from Clariton School District. Tell us about where, where is that? Yes, yes. So Clarendon School District, we're actually um, in the consider the suburbs of Pittsburgh. So when you think about southwestern Pennsylvania, um, the Pittsburgh area, Allegheny County, um, Pittsburgh um, is about 25, 30 minutes south of Pittsburgh. So we are a, a very small, impoverished community, maybe about 10,000 people or less. Um, when you think about our school district, we're actually one building, um, K-12, to and we house um, just shy of about 800 students K-12, so a very small district, a very small community. Wow. All hands on deck, all hands on deck. <laughs> One building, K-12. Yes. Wow. Wow. So that's pretty awesome. So you're, so you're not a principal, but maybe you were a principal. You were probably a teacher in the past. How does, tell us a little bit about what your biggest responsibilities are as a district administrator. Yes, yes. And, and as you've mentioned, so what's interesting is that, um, believe it or not, I was never a teacher. I, I was never a principal. Um, I actually started off in the field of public health. Um, and then from there, I've done a lot of work in which I would partner with K-12 schools. And that's what pretty much like, kind of stemmed my passion for doing more work with K-12 schools um, around school health assessment, school health policy. And then from there, that's what actually led me to pursue my master's degree, which was in education. And then later on, I pursued my doctor of education degree, which I've just graduated from um, the University of Pittsburgh this past August. And so, um, yes, it was a long journey, but, um, you know, it was all worth it. And um, just to answer your question, so, you know, what kind of like really just drove me into that is, believe it or not, I was actually born and raised in Clarendon, and I'm now working in the same district that I graduated from. And so it's great to just have this opportunity. And when you think about my role as an administrator, there's about seven administrators, including um, building principals or superintendent. And in my particular role, I serve as the social services coordinator, um, the home and school visitor. Um, I oversee attendance K-12 throughout our district. And I also, um, I'm also considered the homeless and foster care liaison. So as you can see, a small district, but we're very short staffed. So I wear a bunch of hats. Wow. So you, you do, <laughs> you do wear a lot of hats. Let's yes. dive back into the social services aspect of Claritin. So what, what does that entail? What is that? Yes, yes. So when you think in terms of social services, when, when I consider social services, I think about my role just kind of representing the district. And when you think about our local community, um, I always consider our school as kind of that main hub within a community. And so when you think about social services, you think about um, you know, what, what what particular needs or resources um, do we have that are available at the school level for our students, staff, and families? And for example, um, say hypothetically, there's a family that might um, not be able to afford their monthly rent payment. Then from there, the, the family would contact me and I would kind of be the one to kind of have that resource on deck and kind of be the one to connect the family to that resource. 
Um, another example could be, um, say there's, you know, students when you think about just different barriers to learning. And if there's any students that might not have access to health insurance, they might not have transportation to get to their PCP. Um, maybe the student doesn't have access to glasses, which is a barrier to learning if they can't see the board in front of them. And then from there, um, it would be my primary responsibility to actually reach out to these organizations to actually bring in these resources into the school to remove that barrier. Wow. And so social services is, is very, very broad and it's not and most people will think, is it just related to mental health, behavior health? I think it's the, the entire umbrella. So whether it's, you know, looking at different food banks, having access, you know, food insecurity, um, physical activity programs, you're thinking about mental health, behavior health. It's just the whole umbrella when you think about the, the, um, the whole child model. That's that's very admirable. And yeah, you most of the times when you think about education from a student standpoint, you're thinking about teacher or principal, maybe a superintendent. But there's there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes, including your role to make sure those kiddos have that equal access. So yes, that's very, 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 very admirable. Um, so that leads us to our next question. Tell us a little bit about yourself in terms of your position. What interests, what abilities would you say somebody in your position has to have? Um, I would say um, you have to be passionate about children. Um, you have to be caring. Um, you have to know what it's like to put yourself in other people's shoes, um, you know, more often than not. And so, again, I was born and raised in Clarendon, you know, so I've, I've already had that personal experience. So when you think about the population of students that you're working with, um, low income, underserved. Um, I think more importantly, you have to be able to relate. And so if you don't have that personal experience, um, just by showing that you care, um, showing that you go above and beyond just to meet the needs of the student, um, I think that goes a long way. So I would definitely say um, you want to be caring, you want to be nurturing uh, within my role. You have to know how to just kind of balance everything. And so just knowing that, you know, with social services and in my role, working with um, the type of students that I'm dealing with, um, every day you have to realize like when I leave work is how do I kind of set aside my emotions when I go home every day and I'm with my family. And so just kind of balancing your emotions, you know, the work-life balance. Um, but more, more importantly, I would say just being multifaceted, um, being open and willing to learn every day because every day is a new challenge of in itself. Yeah, that, that would be tough because you know, essentially you're walking into the lives of other people's homes and things along yes. those lines. So I mean, that, yeah, to see things that maybe you don't necessarily disagree, you agree with, you you have to respect that. That's, mm -hmm. that's very admirable. So let me ask you this, in your day to day in this district administration job, what do you think you value the most? What do you, what do you think that you get the most reward from? Wow. Um, so what do I value the most? Um, I think more importantly, what's interesting is when you think about most administrator staff. So we do have our administrative building, which is actually housed outside of the school. But when you think about a principal, they're, they're in the school every single day. And so I think for me in my role, um, what's nice is because I'm kind of in-house. Um, you know, I'm in the building with the students every day. And, and I think what I find most rewarding is that it can be the simplest of things. And I know every single day, I'm making some sort of impact. And so I'll give you a prime example is so um, I had a family. So again, as I mentioned, you know, wearing all of these hats, social services, you know, thinking about truancy and attendance. And th we might have been two weeks into our um, school year and there was a group of students that they wouldn't come to school. And so I had reached out just, to, you know, trying to figure out, you know, well, what's going on? Is everything OK at home? And the issue was, you know, due to the pandemic, parents lost their jobs. Um, the student didn't have access to, you know, to clothing or new shoes, and the dad didn't feel comfortable sending the children to school because he didn't want them to get made fun of. So we think about bullying. Yeah. And so right then and there, um, you know, I asked dad, you know, what do you need? And so in my in my office, I actually, the counselors and myself, our school counselors, we created like a free store. And we, can, we consider like a closet. And so we have um, donations from local churches, um, different organizations, hygiene products. Um, and I asked the dad, you know, what do you need? What sizes do you need? And I'll do whatever I have to do. If I don't have the sizes, you know, I went out and bought everything myself. And I actually just took it to the dad's home. 
And then it, it's interesting because the very next day, those children were in school. And so I think it's just very simple situations like that where, you know, you don't see it coming, but, you know, I happen to just reach out because not everybody is even thinking to do that when you think about, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic and every single day, you know, we have students that are meeting different challenges. And so I think that's what I find the most rewarding is that every single day I'm able to help somebody to some degree. That's awesome. Yeah, you definitely, you change the world without a doubt. That's, that's great. Day to day, what, what, what are some essential skills that you think you have to have, whether you know, it be computer, writing, speaking, listening, math, anything? What are, what are some day to day skills you have to have? To be yes. Yeah, so um, day to day, um, I would say um, computer skills. So when you think about typing, you know, there might be some days when I'm always on email, um, Microsoft Office. Um, I'm always putting together a lot of presentations when I think about school in services, um, district professional development opportunities, um, definitely presentation skills. Um, there have been an, uh, a number of times when I just have to get up in front of um, all of the teachers just to provide a presentation, um, professional development opportunities. Um, I would also say definitely time management because you know when whenever you're you're doing a bunch of different roles and responsibilities you have to be able to prioritize manage your time um just on a day-to-day -day and, and every single day looks different every single day looks different great so you have you're very well educated you have your educational doctor walk us through the path that you have taken in terms of education we can start with your, your high school graduation you know you graduated from Clariton, and yes. where'd you go from there and how you got to your doctorate yes yes um great question so um you know so i was from Clariton, uh, born and raised and so i actually graduated um from Clariton, um uh, valedictorian so i was top of my class and, and I give all credit to, um, you know, I had a lot of teachers that kind of just pushed me. You know, I have, I was raised in a home where they where they truly valued education. And so that actually just continued to push me. Um, and then just thinking about my peers, the community in which I grew up in, that actually pushed me to just go all the way. And so I said, one day, I don't know when it's gonna be, I'm gonna get my doctorate degree. I don't know what it's gonna be in, but I'm, uh, but I'm adamant about getting this. And then um, from there, I would say, um, my educational path actually stemmed from a lot of my work experience. And so, you know, initially it started with my passion and, and I've always had a passion for working with, you know, students in underserved populations. I've always had a passion for, you know, health promotion practice, um, school health and wellness. And so what I did is I just continued to follow my path. And so initially um, I had went to Slipper Rock University of Pennsylvania and initially, believe it or not, I went to school for athletic training because, you know, I said, you know, I was an athlete at the time in high school. Um, you know, I wanted to be an athletic trainer. And it wasn't until, you know, I firsthand was able to experience some of my coursework. And I asked myself, is this truly what I'm passionate about? You know, you know, could I see myself doing this every single day for the rest of my life? And I said, no. And I said, if I can do something every single day for the rest of my life and not get paid to do it, what would I want to do? And that's when I said, I would just want to help people. I would want to give back. I want to do, I want to be more active in my own community. And so from there, um, I actually changed my, my major to community health, which eventually became public health. And as you know, public health is so broad. And it's nice because, um, you know, you're, you're able to kind of go different pathways from there. Um, I started in the healthcare field. So within the Pittsburgh region, I worked for UPMC for seven years. Um, children's Hospital. I did a lot of work around um, community education. Um, I taught community kitchen classes. Um, I did community events, outreach events. Um, I did corporate health and wellness for employees. And from there, um, that's what kind of streamlined my um, field of practice. And I wanted to stay working at Children's Hospital. And so while I was there, I had the opportunity to actually grow within that department. And that's what led me to eventually say, well, I love public health, but I'm also passionate about education. And so how can I really, you know, just combine the two? I want to merge the two. And so from there, that's when I decided to pursue um, my education degree at Duquesne University, um, in which I pursued my master's uh, of science in education with my concentration in educational studies. Um, from there, I continued to work. I did a lot of work around school health. Um, partnering with school districts, um, providing them with resources and tools and providing ongoing training and technical assistance. 
Um, and then eventually, it, I almost feel like my doctor, I don't want to say it kind of fell into my lap, but it was almost it was like too too good to be true because along the lines of doing a lot of this work in the community with schools um, one of the departments that i had partnered with at the at the university of pittsburgh was actually professors in the field in which i pursued my doctorate degree and so from there um, like, like i said everything just kind of aligned but more importantly it started with my passion and exact and just figuring out what exactly i wanted to do that's a heck of a story wow and you, yeah, you came up through the ranks. And for for our audience that's listening out there, in terms of in terms of uh, uh, education after you graduate, we call that post secondary education. You mm -hmm. enter into a, either a, a two or four year degree. It doesn't have to be college. But one of the things that we find in education is that if you are working in education, every just about everybody has at least a four year college degree. And Dr. Weatherspoon went forward and got that. And then after you graduate of four years, then you can go on to get your master's degree, which is which is usually about a 30 to 60 credit program, depending on which university you go to. And then beyond that master's, then you have a doctorate degree. And when we hear doctor general, we think, you know, somebody in a hospital, but there's a multi, there's lots of different types of doctors. You can have a philosophical doctor, you can have an educational doctor, you can have an MD. So we have Dr. Weatherspoon, which um, is your is your doctorate in education? Yes, yes, that's correct. So my doctorate degree is um, doctor of education and my concentration is health and physical activity. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks. So if you had to uh, give our kid before we open it up for Q&A, which we do have some questions here. If you had to give some uh, some parting advice to maybe uh, some upperclassmen or maybe some high school students of some essential skills that they would need to carry into anything post-secondary, whether it's work, whether it's a two-year degree or a four-year degree, what do you think they should focus? Mm, I would say um, initially, like even looking back, um, if I were to do it all over again, um, what I would suggest is, you know, I, I feel like we live in a society where they always push, you know, go to college, you know, go to college, get your education, which is important. Um, but I would highly strongly suggest um, until you know what you're extremely passionate about, um, until you know what you want to do, which I would say initially start with that work experience. Um, so, you know, you know, get that work experience. And then from there, that experience will lead you to obtaining whatever career path you'll need in terms of education. And so I would definitely start with work experience, then pursue the degree. Because and also I didn't share this, but um, my employer actually helped me to pay for my degree. Yeah. And so that's why I said, like, it's really good just to kind of get that work experience because, you know, there's a lot of scholarships, a lot of benefits out there. But you don't want to waste your time and you don't want to get frustrated and kind of go into something that you're unsure about. And as I had mentioned, you know, I initially went to school for an athletic training and I knew I was going to be an athletic trainer. But it wasn't until, you know, I, I hit this aha moment and I was like, I'm not passionate about this. I can't see myself doing this for the rest of my life. You know, what do I really want to do? And so I would say um, work experience is is key. It's crucial, um, you know, obtaining the education. But I feel like um, more importantly, when you look at seeking out jobs, the two kind of go hand in hand. And so even when you look at your resume, it's not just about um, always having that degree, but they want to look at your experience as well. Certainly. Mm -hmm. Certainly yeah, a, that's that's great advice. So we do have some questions in the queue, and Anne, I'm going to turn it over to Ann Conti. She's our career readiness facilitator here. She's going to uh, throw some of these questions at you, and yeah. Yeah, we do have a handful in here. Now, I think you've touched on some of them, but let's start. Our first one is in your position, and I'm, I guess, shout out to the person who submitted this. If I'm interpreting the question incorrectly, please send me a message. But if in your position, could you have a learning disability? And they said speech, ADHD, et cetera. I would say yes. I would say yes. Um, I've actually attended um, last week. So when I think about and, and again, my role is pretty multifaceted. And so I would say absolutely. Um, um, when, when I think about last week, I had attended a statewide conference. And I just think about the number of people that were even presenting, you know, that had similar roles to me that had, you know, um, different disabilities and things like that. So absolutely, absolutely. Awesome, thank you. 
Um, mm -hmm. Somebody did ask about what skills and schooling is needed for your position, but I think we've definitely hit home on that. And I appreciate you talking about your career and education pathway. So I think we've got that one. Um, somebody asked, I've been thinking about a possible career path with administrative roles in a school. What are some of the responsibilities and or personal qualities of your fellow administrators? Oh, great, great question. And so when I think about fellow administrators, um, so administration can actually vary. And so most, for example, when I think about my colleagues who are principals, um, some of them may have started out with a teaching career. So they went to school, um, got their degree in education, they were teaching for a while, and then they went back to school to get their principal certification. Um, same thing with a superintendent. Uh, most people will, will have um, teaching experience, you'll have that teaching degree, that certification, then you'll pursue principal certification, have some experience. I think it's typically like three to five years, like three years experience before you can even apply to get your um, letter of eligibility for the superintendent. Um, one of my assistant principals, believe it or not, her background was in mental health. And so she started off doing, um, I want to say like a SAP liaison or like a like a um, like a mobile therapist. So she started out working in um, the mental health field of practice, and then from there she um, went to get her degree in teaching, which led her to eventually principal. Um, when you also think of administration, as I mentioned, it's not just principals, superintendent, but you might have an administrator that's over curriculum and instruction. Um, you might have someone who is um, a supervisor over special education. And so again, um, typically it just starts with, with some sort of experience, um, whether it's working with children. Um, I had one of my colleagues who just became a teacher um, in my district last week. And prior to that, he had done some work at Children's Hospital, um, UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and he had done some work around child advocacy working in the hospital. So typically, um, as long as you have some experience working with children, um, whether it's early childhood or early child care um, education, and then from there, it'll kind of bring you up to speed with um, working in a school setting. Yes, thank you. And we know lots of different roles, lots of different hats that administrators can play. So thank you for kind of laying out what the land might look like mm -hmm. in those roles. So next question, does this career path support LGBTQ plus the, that community? Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and, and that's something, um, even in the schools right now, that's something that they're actually more um, considerate about. And so I think about um, even our school counselors, um, they do a lot of work around the LGBTQ. So absolutely, it's, it's very diverse, very, like I said, very diverse, absolutely. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Um, so this isn't a question that was submitted, but it's been submitted almost every other time. So I'm gonna give it to you anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> can you name something that you dislike about your job? Hmm. I feel like the good outweighs the bad, but which is a good place to be, right? <laughs> yes. Um, I would say something that I dislike would probably be um when you think about a school system, um, it's a system, right? And so there's a bunch of moving parts. You know, everybody has to be on the same page, everybody has to be collaborating and working together. And I think that's what I dislike, not just about my current position, but any field of practice I've been in is because you're always going to have someone or, or, or people who just aren't willing to work together. Um, and so a lot of times that can actually slow things down. It can pre prevent, you know, you know, positive things from happening. Um, and, and I feel like it can actually jeopardize the system. Like you might have some people, you know, that are opposed to it. So um, for an example, um, I think about maybe like attendance, like a policy, a school policy. Um, maybe, for example, when you think about put, developing a school policy, there might be the elementary, which again, it, it, as I had mentioned, we're one building, we're K to 12, but we're two separate schools housed in the same building. And so you may have the elementary staff or the elementary principal that may want to go about things one way and the middle school, high school, they go about the complete opposite. 
And so when you think about the, the effect and the impact that might have on the teachers and the students, especially when they're transitioning from elementary to middle school. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, thanks for sharing. I'm happy that your job, in your job, you feel like the good outweighs the bad and that that's a tougher question to answer. <laughs> um, so the next question, and again, I'm gonna make sure, if I don't interpret it right to whoever posted it, please send me a reply. Um, the question is, is there a way to get a job before you know exactly what you want to do for college, but you know you want to help people? And I'm wondering, too, if you can speak to, you know, if you have that desire to help your community when you're in high school, what are some of the things that you could maybe do? Oh, absolutely. So even thinking in high school, um, there's always a lot of opportunities. If not, it's just kind of like putting yourself out there. Um, when I think about like my community, there's a lot of volunteer opportunities. Um, there's opportunities in which you can volunteer at the school, out in the community. Um, a lot of a lot of different communities might have different um, different coalitions. Um, so I would say initially it's good to just get that volunteer experience. Um, a lot of times, if it's not coming through the school district offer, offering these opportunities, thinking about just like the local businesses within your community that you can volunteer. Um, I know a lot of early child care providers, they might require clearances. It just depends. Um, I think about, you know, like the police station um, or, or fire department. So there's always so if you think about something that truly interests you and you're not sure whether or not this is the path you want to take, I would highly recommend try to volunteer. If not, reach out to that organization to see if you can even somehow shadow them, like maybe shadow somebody that's kind of working within that field to get that experience. Yeah, great advice. Totally agree. All right, mm -hmm. next question. Do you think it's harder to be in one building than two or the other way around? Oh, I would say so this. So um, <laughs> that's a good question. So, so I'm thinking about um, just different rules. So in my current rule, as I mentioned, we're one building, which I like it because it's it's less traveling. So when you, when you think about your typical workday, if I'm working an eight hour workday and say I was say I had the same exact rule, same exact responsibilities and position at another school, which might at another district, which might have like five different uh, schools, I would spend so much time traveling in between school districts. And I think about the amount of commute and travel time that's wasted on things I could be doing as opposed to being in one building. And so I like the idea of having it centralized because it's less traveling. I have more work time. I'm able to kind of just go in between the floors. So I would say I prefer to have one building. Yeah. And you make a good case for it, too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so next question. And I'm going to ask a follow up question to it because we've gotten this one before. Do you recommend specific colleges for this position and career pathway? But also, if you could speak a little bit to what makes a good academic program for this? So what would you say like you want to look for a master's program or a PhD or bachelor's with X, Y and Z? Because I know you might not be able to speak to specific recommendations, but what about that experience would make it really rich and rewarding? Yes. And so um, when it comes to um, education, so in terms of um, like the, the college or the university setting, I always say if you're going to pursue a program, uh, pursue something that's pursue a program that's accredited and highly reputable. And so um, one of my former professors, she had shared with me when you go to school for your undergraduate degree, oftentimes people will go for the reputation. So you want to look at um, how reputable is the program because the, the the professors and staff might be able to have like a network of connections for you to land that job or to get more experience. Um, and when I think about a master's or doctorate level, I always pursue it, but like I pursued my doctorate and my master's based off of the faculty that are within the program. And so again, I feel like it goes hand in hand. So in terms of a, uh, of a, of a career path, um, I feel like there's no one set way to go. Um, so I feel like it, if you wanna work in the education field, 
it never hurts to get an education degree. Um, as I mentioned, um, an accredited institution um, in terms of, how do I want to say this? So in terms of education, um, I feel like it's so, like every university is different. So for example, I can go to University of Pittsburgh and get a degree in education and my concentration could be in health and physical activity or it could be in psychology and education. But I can go right down the street to Duquesne University and they may not have the same program. And so I feel like either way, um, the program design may look a little different, but for the most part, you're still going to have a lot of the key staff, people, and individuals that have that experience that can, can that can connect, that, that can make the right connection for you. Thank you. Thank you for answering that one. A little bit of a trickier question, I think. Um, yeah. Want to be mindful of your time and everybody's time out there. We do have one more question in our live Q and A. Um, can you speak to what type of work that you do that's different than the counselors and the school counselors in your building? Yeah, so I would say when I think about my role um, compared to the school counselors, the school counselors are more, um, they have more of like that one-on-one -on -one approach with students. And so in my role as the administrator, I don't have, even though I'm housed in the building and I kind of, you know, pass along the hallways with students, I don't have have a lot of that interface one-on-one -on -one with students unless it's related to as I had mentioned I'm the homeless and foster liaison but I would say for the most part the counselors do more hands-on one-on-one experience um, the counselors do more you know small groups they can do classroom lessons you, you know they're doing a lot more like de-escalation um, strategies with students whereas me um, at the admin level where I would work with the counselors is maybe providing them with the resources, the tools, the tips, and the education and training. So I would feel like I feel like we work together, but in terms of our roles, it, it's somewhat different. They're more hands on. Yep. So we did have one more come in and I'm going to throw it out because I think it'll be a quick one. What hours are what are your hours per week? What does your yeah. work week look like? Okay, um, and so my work week um, in this position, I'm pretty much um, an eight hour workday. And so um, our school, our students are pretty much in school from eight until 245. And so my hours are 730 to 330, um, but it can vary. And so on the weekends, if we have weekend activities, community events that I might have to represent for the school, I might have to attend those. Um, there might be some evenings. So when you think about like parent teacher conferences, um, school wellness events that might take place in the evening. That might be something that I'll have to attend to. Um, but for the most part, the hours are pretty standard and good along with the school day. But as an administrator, um, I work throughout the school year. And so when you think about teachers who may have the summers off, I'm actually a 12 month employee. But it's nice because I do have um, the holidays, the extended breaks. And when you think about winter break, spring break, I do have that time off, the same as teachers. Awesome. Thank you for answering that one. Somebody said have a great year. So thank you. I you think too. that's for you. Um, <laughs> well, we we really appreciate you spending time with us to chat about your your career, your pathway, the school that you work for. It's all been really great information. And a thank you to all of our participants who asked really great questions today. Nick, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Do you have anything else you would like to add? I uh, know just a special a special thank you to Dr. Weatherspoon and the district administrators are very, very, very busy. And I just want to throw it out there. One more Q&A. The average starting wage or yearly rate. And that's 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 kind of a loaded question. But in terms of a district administrator, I mean, that's up to you how you want to approach that one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm pretty open. So um, it, honestly, it depends on, I would say, the school setting. So I'm working in a public school. And when you look at a public school versus a private or a charter school, I would say an administrator can be anywhere from 70,000 to about 150. And a lot of times it might not be starting out, but depending on your year's experience. So I'll give you an example. There might be, say like a teacher, a teacher might start out maybe making like 
$40,000 a year. But if she's working for about five years and then say she wants to be a principal and she, she or he pursues their principal certification, they may jump from 50,000 to maybe 90,000. So it typically depends on the type of setting and then also just depending on the district, because again, depending on the, the location, the setting, some school districts, teachers or administrators, they might be making a lot more than others. Yeah. And that's and, just speaking to Pennsylvania. Yes, and as public employees of, of public entities, um, salaries are public. There's a there's a website out there. It's called openpa.gov. And mm -hmm. yeah, and if you want to throw that into make that an announcement, anybody can can look that up. We're all public yep. employees. Dr. Weatherspoon, thank you so much for connecting with us. Um, we're going to have this recorded, guys, and we're going to get this posted to our website here very quickly. But thanks for joining us and thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity and